prevail against him. For many of you, that verse is very familiar. For all of us, we tend to be reminded of what that verse means and what that verse is saying. Simply stated, it's Jesus who will build the church. Man does not build the church. Creativity does not build the church. Human ingenuity does not build the church. The Lord Jesus Christ will build his church. And he said this, the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Death itself could not, would not overcome the church. The gates represent the imprisoning power of death. Death will not be able to stop the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't stop the Lord Jesus Christ. He, having died on the cross and having been buried, three days later, as the song says, he tore the bars away. He overcame death. He conquered it and he defeated it. Death will not swallow up the church that Jesus is building. As long as the earth stands, as long as time is, Jesus will have a church. Paul teaches in Ephesians 4 verses 12 and 13 that Christ gave to the church men who are gifted they're not special, but they are gifted to shepherd and teach and lead God's church. The passage that I quoted or referenced, Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, and he gave some pastors and teachers. And the role of pastors and teachers is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, friends, while Jesus' church will never die, it will stand as long as the world stands. Individual local churches do die. Churches can and do decline. Most of us are able to think in our minds where we grew up of churches in our community that maybe once were uh, excelling or flourishing, and now they are practically faded. In fact, in our own Southern Baptist Convention, a coalition of like-minded churches, in the past decade, our convention has seen a decline of 2 million members. 2 million people that in 2009-10 that were affiliated with a Southern Baptist church are no longer affiliated. Now, granted, there are perhaps a lot of reasons for that, but the truth is that if we think of losing 2 million members in 10 years, when we realize that the population of the United States has grown by 23 million we're, we're, something's out of balance. We've lost 2 million members. The U.S. population has grown by nearly 23 million. We're not keeping pace. Not only is that metric one that we can look at, but we also measure, for good or bad, we measure how we're reaching people by the number of people we baptize. And in a church like ours, that seeks to take membership seriously. And I'm grateful that there's a growing number of SBC churches that are doing that. When we are seeking to uh, do our best to in ensure that people have made a credible profession of faith, even with that, however, our, our baptismal numbers, again, thinking of a coalition of churches, of across the SBC, if we use that as a metric for the number of people we are reaching, that number has significantly dropped. And again, I think there, there may be some legitimate understandable reasons, but this past year, or years, 2019, 2020, saw the lowest number of persons evangelized reach for the gospel and baptized 
in any year since the year 20, or I'm sorry, 19, 19, 1920. If you know your history, you know that there was also a, a pandemic during those years, the, the influenza, influenza pandemic. And I'm sure, again, that had something to do with it. But all these caveats that I'm giving, the measurements say that as a convention, we're not reaching people as once we did. We're not doing as well as perhaps once we did. Again, churches that once flourished are faded or have begun to fade. And as a pastor, I don't want ever for that to be true of this church. I don't think any pastor wants that to be true, to see a church in decline or to fade. And yes, we are going up a very steep hill with COVID that, as some say, we may just have to live with this. This may just be the new normal. It may not like, okay, we're over that mountain. It's over. It's done. That's something to look back to. We're sad. We're glad that it's, it's over. COVID may be the new normal. So with all that said, one of the roles of pastors concerns reminding the church of what matters and why it matters. That's a part of the equipping. What matters and why it matters. And so to that end, this sermon is going to take a little bit of a different twist than what normally you would hear uh, in that this is not so much an exposition of a specific passage. I'll be referring to a lot of passages today. Uh, this is not the norm, but it is important that I kind of walk you through the story, uh, or the, the backstory, if you will, of what I'm going to roll out to you today on behalf of the pastors concerning a revisioning for Woolsey Baptist Church. So, one of the roles as pastors, again, is to concern ourselves with what matters and why it matters. There are times that a church, if it's not going to decline, if it's going to be alive, has to step back and revision to ask itself, remind itself, why are we here? And once we've identified why we are here, or recalibrated on why we're here, how are we doing with what we're supposed to be here for? And so as a group of staff and lay pastors, we meet regularly. You heard Josh's testimony that we do meet. We meet every other Tuesday, sometimes it's in the afternoon, sometimes it's in the evening. And you heard one of the things we do, almost without exception, we sing a hymn together or some song. And you can judge for yourself if you were to put your ear up to the door how that sounded. Uh, thankfully, Matt is always there, so that does help. Um, but we sing, not, not measuring how we sound, but we want to worship together as a group of men we usually read something from the Bible. We pray together. Not just someone open us in prayer, but we pray for this church. And so we, we spend a uh, usually a rather significant block of time, sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes it may be 30 or 40, but we go through a certain list. Can't go through the entire list, but we, we may start with the A's and go through the E's and, and we pray specifically for members of the church. We pray for you by name. The likelihood is you have already been prayed for in the past months. Uh, we, we know of needs. Sometimes we don't know of anything. But if we know of a need, we pray for that need. We praise God. We thank God for you as an individual. We, we pray for concerns that your family may have. So we we sing together, we read scripture together, we spend time praying together, and then we begin to ask, um, we, we begin to think about events, plans, strategies, pastoral concerns, things that need addressing. 
In January and February of this year, we had a lot of discussion around the question, what's next for Woolsey Baptist Church? What is our next next? What does God have for us? We, we don't want to be in a routine or a rut. We, we don't want to just look at what we're doing and say everything's great. But what is next and what is God leading us to do? We ask questions again, such as where is he leading us? We had talked a lot in the past year. Uh, really, we talked back in 2019 and or 2018. We talked some in 2019, or, or I'm sorry, 2019 and 2020 about a building. We ask, is it time to start talking about that? We ask about what ministries we should begin, what ministries we should stop. Just because a church starts something does not mean it should always do it. Quite honestly, some things we should begin, some things we should ask, are we needing to continue this? We talked about where we're effective and where we're ineffective. We tried to be as objective and honest with ourselves as we could be. In this process of a lot of things written on a whiteboard and a lot of discussion, eventually the suggestion was made, why don't you, you being me, get away for a few days and spend some time thinking and praying and come back and share with us what the Lord may have put on your heart. And so I did that. I got away to, in Pine Mountain back in April. I believe it was April, uh, March or April of this year. I spent two and a half days away. Uh, most of that time was spent in a, in a small room that had... Um, a whiteboard essentially built all around in, in, in the room. And, and so on paper, with my computer and on the board, with my Bible, a, a lot of thinking, a lot of praying, a lot of processing, and a lot of asking those questions. After those hours and days away, I returned and shared this time away with the other pastors. But before I left, to prepare myself to go, one of the things that was heavy on my heart was sensing a need already to revision our purpose. To, to, to recast or to revision, to see afresh as a congregation, what does God have us on the corner of Hampton and Antioch Road to do? Why are, why are we here? Why do we exist? So thinking through that ahead of time, the thought occurred to me that we really do need to simplify not just our purpose, but our processes. How do we do what we do? I came to serve at this church in September of 1987. A few months after arriving here, I met with the handful of Sunday school teachers we had at that time, which was well, I'll just fast forward through this. We put everybody in the room, the teachers and their spouses, there were about seven of us, and we talked about the church. We talked about um, what the church's purpose is then, and we tried to do a lot of deep thinking about that. And I just rolled out the, the phrase, to know Christ and to make him known. I didn't originate that. I told those uh, folks in the room, it didn't come up with me. It was a motto or the purpose statement of Columbia Bible College. And so I rolled that out as a purpose for Woolsey Baptist Church, to know Christ and to make him known. And it stuck, and it's kind of been what we've printed and we've talked about for years. Do I think it's a very, did I think it was a great statement? Yes. Do I still think it's a great statement? Yes, I do. But I have felt for some time that while it's a great statement, it's, it's a statement that is lacking in clarity. Certainly to know Christ is clear, to make him known is clear, but it's, it's general. It, it's not something that, in my understanding, that we can measure very well. How do we know if we're knowing Christ? What are the measurements that we can look at to see if she is knowing Christ and growing in her knowledge. And how is that being fleshed out in her or his life? How are we making him known? What are the metrics that we, 
we can look to you to see if we're making him known. So, as I said earlier, churches tend to decline. Statements can become uh, meaningless, maybe like a beautiful painting that the, the artist intended to convey uh, a message through her, her drawing or his painting. It, it can become something that we just walk by and miss. So, in this time away, stepping back, reviewing some of the key biblical texts associated with the church, looking at our existing statements, of which there were, in addition to one I mentioned, there were a lot. And they're all, again, I think they're good. But reviewing a lot of those statements, many that, that seem difficult to, or, or rather to say, how, how do we do all these? How do we, how do we learn all these? How, how do we do them? And and quite frankly, even as we looked at them as pastors, to, to be able to recite them or state them all was a little bit beyond us, and we, we see them quite often. So looking at existing statements and then thinking about some work that our children's ministry and our student ministries have done recently where they have rolled out I'll call it a mission statement, a vision statement, a purpose statements that I, I looked at their work and I thought, wow, this is a lot of work. So how can I uh, take what they've done and somehow incorporate that or, or not come up with something that just dismisses that? So that's a little bit of the backstory, wanting to incorporate this work that had been done, but primarily thinking through what the Bible says about the church, also our core values. I didn't mention that. Looking at our core values, of which there was quite a list. And I, as I shared in the first service, I remember a person who was considering membership of our church and asked to meet with me and made the, or just asked the question, I see there are a long list of core values. Which of these core values are really core? Because this is quite a list and this is a person that I've grown to love and respect and, and know that we're gifted in different ways and know that this individual is, is quite gifted in leadership. And so it got me to thinking, these are good core values, but my goodness, which ones are the core of the core? So looking at all this and then what does the Bible reveal about the church? And I'm confident that that should be what drives what we're going to accomplish or want to accomplish. So I aimed in that time to reduce my thoughts, everything around that room on those boards or walls, everything on paper, everything I typed. I tried to go back and then begin to reduce that to just a few simple concrete statements, as few a words as possible. And came home, met with our pastors, we had discussion, there were suggestions, there was input, uh, there was a subcommittee out of that that broke off and, and worked with what I had brought back, worked with the ideas and suggestions that had been given, met with me, gave their input, I think we actually met twice, met back as a group of pastors, and so here's where we landed, something that we believe says why we exist, and it also tells the process with clarity and movement. So we exist, if we can go to that slide, please. We exist to follow Jesus by worshiping God, by connecting with others, by serving the church and going to make disciples. So if you'll just look at those words, the the ing words there those are some of those are the key words as a church what we believe is important we what we believe the scripture says we're supposed to do we're, we're there's a lot we could say there's a lot that's important but if you boil it down to the core if if like a a business that is going to stay current and we're not a business i understand that but if we don't force ourselves sometimes to ask questions and hard questions, a business that doesn't reinvent or recreate or think through itself, 
that business will not be in business. So it has to ask, what are we in business for? And how are we doing in business? How are we doing with what we're here for? A church has to ask that. Why are we here? And how are we doing with what we're here for? So we exist to follow Jesus. That's what we want to be about. Follow Jesus. Worship. Connect. Serve. And go. Those are, are four key words that I, I would hope could be a part of our DNA. So look at the graphic. And please don't, if you want to draw this, fine. But understand that um, this is going to change. This will not, the words are not going to change. But the, the final revision of this has not been done. But I think this captures what, what we're headed for. If you look at those arrows right in the center and you think of, of a cross or you think of following Jesus, if you and I are following Jesus, these are at least four, four essentials if we're going to be a, a well-rounded, full-orbed, living, breathing Christian. These are four things that should characterize us. We should be known for our worship of God. And let me say, Worship is not at the top and go make disciples is not at the bottom because the top is what is the most important and the bottom is somewhat important if we get to it and the sides are, are for a few people. Each is important. Each is necessary. Each is a part of a Christian's life. So if we just walk through these for just a moment, worship, Connect, serve, and go. If someone were to ask you in a conversation, what is your church about? What's important in your church? I would hope in time you're going to know those words, that you believe these things are important. That we're followers of Jesus. We want to follow Jesus. We want others to follow Jesus. And following Jesus means that we worship God. We connect with others relationally. We serve the church and we go out to make disciples. We believe the Bible calls us to follow Jesus. Mark 8, 34, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And we want to heed that. We want to heed that call and call others to follow Jesus. But what would it look like? What would a follower of Jesus do? Well, a follower of Jesus, again, would do those things you see in that circle. A follower of Jesus would worship God. We worship privately. The psalmist said, come, let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. So we worship individually. We should do that. You can call that devotions, personal time alone with God, quiet time, loud time, doesn't matter what you call it, but there needs to be a time that as an individual believer, you meet with God. And I want to go so far as to say, church, that if that's not a part of your life, then the other component that I'm about to talk about will not really have a lot of value in your life. If you neglect the Bible and prayer during the week, then showing up in here that should be a time for refueling what you've already put into your heart and life and exhorting and encouraging that, this is going to seem somewhat flat to you if you don't personally, individually worship God. So we, we gather, however, not just do we do this individually, but Hebrews remind us that we're not to neglect meeting together. As some are in the manner or habit of doing. But all the more as you see the day drawing near, we're to encourage one another. And so worship is a component of someone who's following Jesus. But follower, followers of Jesus need more than just corporate worship. Because right now, when we were together, or when we are together, when we sing together, that's important. We encourage one another in that. We encourage as we see one another come in. But relationally, we need not just learning. We do need learning. We do need facts poured into us. But we also need to learn how to apply those facts. 
So a connect group, it's not just a time for checking a box that you've gained a little more information, but it's a time to connect relationally. It's a time to encourage one another. It's a time for accountability. And that's a word that causes some people almost to break out in a rash. Oh, I don't want to be accountable to anyone. I don't want anyone to ask me any hard questions. But you don't grow without accountability. You don't change without being honest and real about your struggles. You don't change spiritually just by standing in a room and singing and hearing a preacher preach. You change and God changes you in the context of a small group where the mask and the layers begin to come off and you begin to be open and real about your, your life and your needs. Not that every Sunday there has to be a convulsion of, of the deepest, darkest, ugliest parts of our past or our struggles, but there has to be more than just the dispensing of information. There has to be more than just gaining a little bit more knowledge. How does this apply? How will I flesh this out? How do I help and encourage others? The Bible has several one another commands. I, I, I have some in my notes. I'm just going to bypass that in the interest of time and just tell you that there are over 50 times in the New Testament where the Bible gives explicit commands that we call one another. There are things we're to do with one another. And we cannot do that unless we are relationally connected. You cannot bear one another's burdens sitting in a room like this. You cannot exhort one another. You cannot forgive one another. You, you, can, you and I cannot serve one another when we're isolated. And so to that end, not only do we worship and connect, but we also need to serve. Life needs to be flowing out of us. We need an avenue to serve the Lord. We need some way to do that. If all you do is sit and soak, you're going to... Good night. This is not... This is just a thought came to my mind, but if you've ever left a dish rag that's just gotten wet... It just, what does it do? It gets to smelling. And I'm, I'm not saying anybody smells, but I'm telling you, church, that if all you do is soak in and you are never squeezed and nothing goes out of you, it's like those two bodies of water in Israel. One has life and, and one doesn't. The Sea of Galilee has water flowing into it and out of it. The Dead Sea does not. So we're either going to be like one of those bodies of water. And I'm saying one of the ways that we are changed is by serving. By putting ourselves in positions where we have to depend on the Lord. Not just having someone serve me, but serving others. And so there needs to be a way that every, if you're a member of this church, you need a way that you're serving. And so for some of you saying, well, I'm not doing anything. I have no clue. I, I, I don't even know where to begin. Well, consider when you leave this morning, go through the lobby, the, the volunteer roundup coming up October the 10th. There's no obligation. There's no commitment cards. I promise I will do this with children or preschoolers. But you can at least learn about a way to serve. That's one. That's one way. But if, if all you do is Come and take a seat, and then go take a seat in a connect group. If you do get there, you're not going to change. Serving puts us in a position where even if it's a gift, even if we're gifted in it, that we have to be utterly dependent on the Lord. I am naturally not an in-front kind of person. I, I am quite, I wouldn't say that I'm shy or withdrawn, but standing up here in front of you and knowing that this is what God put on my heart that I was going to be doing when I was a teenager is not the most natural thing in the world. And so to that end, although I've been doing this a lot of years now, there's not a week goes by that I don't come with a holy dread of these moments, a sense of awe of, of God's 
why me? Why are you, why am I in front of people? And furthermore, God, this is just not my, my natural, uh, I just don't feel like I'm, I'm just unnatural at this. And I'm just telling you to serve the Lord does not mean that you have to find something that you want. I know I absolutely can't do that. But serving causes you to be dependent on him. And so that's a component. But then going and making disciples. This on the bottom, go make disciples. I think we relegate that to, well, that's what a missionary does. And there's people that have had this special sense of call and, and they're just real good at that. And so we, we let them go do it. And, and the way that we support it is writing a check. And praise God for the writing of checks. It's important. It is essential. But I think we dismiss the fact that God's called us all to go make disciples. No believer has, has an, an out on that. No believer has a, I don't do this card. If you're a Christian, you are as responsible to go make disciples as you are to worship God. But here's what, can I just tell you what we often think? If we take care of that top of the circle, if I show up in this building and occasionally make my way to a group, then I'm doing about all I can do. God's called us to do more. So each of these components, worship, connect, serve, go. I, I want that to get into our, our DNA. It's just a part of our lives. Now, near the beginning of this message, I reminded you that the Bible says Christ gave pastors to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. The passage continues, and I didn't read this part, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, in these closing moments, I will just ask you to pull in, as it were, and listen very carefully. What is mature manhood? What does the Bible mean when, when Paul said, this is what pastors are to do, to to help bring the body to mature manhood. It's not age. It's not how old you are. Praise God for those that the Lord let stay here a long time and you have a lot of wisdom just through your years of life that we can go through, but you can be many years chronologically and very spiritually immature. So mature manhood is not age, nor do I believe it is exclusively knowledge. Knowledge is a part of it, but it's not the sum total of it. You can, uh, you can know quite a bit, but that uh, knowledge that you have of facts, you, you, can, you can memorize Bible verses, and you and I should. You can know the books of the Bible. You can know your church history or systematic theology. You, you can be very theologically astute and educated. So it's not just knowledge. I read a book that I, I really thought was very helpful at this point, and there's one question, and here it is, that stood out to me. I'm gonna, I put in my notes. I want you to answer it silently. Here it is. Who would you say is more mature? The person who knows a hundred things about God and applies one of them or the person who knows only two things about God and applies both? So, no grading of your test, but that's the test question. Answer it in your head. Who knows more? Who's more mature? The one who knows a hundred things about God and only applies two of them or the person that only knows two things but applies them both? Well, in reality, the person who knows two things but applies both would be far more mature. Maturity is not facts that you and I assimilate. 
And according to Romans 8, 29, God's intent in saving us concerns conforming us to the image of his son, causing us to look more and more like Jesus, embracing more and more of the characteristics of the fruit of the spirit Paul delineates in Galatians chapter 5. And how, how does that happen? How do we mature? Well, God's intent is to use the church to do that. God's, God's purpose is to call to himself out of his grace a people that he will save and through the men that he gives to his church to shepherd and lead and equip. God's intent is to shape and mold and frame us so that we look more and more like Jesus and less and less like ourselves. But the church... The whole church is a part of that. And so that's why, if I can just touch on it one more time, gathering together is important. Connecting relationally is essential. Serving is a, a necessary part of growing as a Christian. And going out and making disciples. Is it? Is that part hard? Yeah. This isn't too hard, not in our Western culture. There's very little risk in you showing up in this room. Going and making disciples, that's a little harder. And I said this earlier, and I'm going to say this in this service. I don't feel like I'm a good disciple maker. I don't feel very effective in winning people to Jesus. I faithfully, I think I can truthfully say this, I'm faithful in sharing the gospel. Shared the gospel yesterday with someone. I don't feel like that I'm one that sees a lot of converts, a lot of people in that moment that says yes to Jesus. But I'm a part of the chain. I'm a part of a process just like you are in disciple making. And somewhere, someday, somebody will be that last link that everything is going to come together. Sometimes you may be the first one. But here's the point I want to make with this. Maybe it's not true of you, but for me, I normally have a sense of fear when I start that conversation. There's a, there, there's, it's not so much a dread. It's just a little sense of anxiety, a little quirky feeling of this may be awkward, this may not go well. And you know what I think we have to learn how to do? We just have to learn how to do it when we're afraid. We just have to learn how to talk about Jesus, even if we're afraid. God's probably not going to take that sense of anxiety or fear away. In fact, that sense of anxiety or fear can be the very platform that God uses to cause you to say, Lord, I can't do this. Because you already know you can't. You know you can't convert anyone. Only the Spirit of God can convert. We're just the instrument. We're the mouthpiece. I say all this to say, go make disciples is just as important as sitting in this room. We exist to follow Jesus by worshiping God by connecting with others, by serving the church and going to make disciples. So I want to ask you, we'll see member, if you were not in a correct connect group this morning, why? You may have a legitimate reason, but if you were not in a connect group, just answer that in your head, why? Do you not need others? Are you beyond accountability? Have you learned everything you need to know? Another question, where are you serving? And what steps will you take this coming week to learn ways to serve? I gave you an idea. Sign up to come on October 10th. What action step will you take to go make disciples this week? It's not just going to happen unless you plan for it. If you just have this idea, I'll do it if it happens, it's not going to happen. 
It's like a lot of disciplines in our life. If we don't plan for them, if we don't pray and ask God to put people in our path, it's really strange in my life. Every morning that I sit on the side of my bed trying to just get the fog out of my head, and I say, God, somewhere in this day, would you put someone in my path I can share the gospel with? It's strange. It doesn't happen every day, but it's strange when I do it that often it does. So what steps will you take this week to be a disciple maker? And what adjustments should you make to prepare and gather next Lord's Day for worship? What steps should you take during the week? If you're not yet a part of this church, I hope you'll hear the gracious invitation that we want you. We want you first to be saved. That's primary. We want you to trust in Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, you're lost. You're separated from God. You're on the road to hell. You will eternally suffer damnation in outer darkness, cut off forever from God, and that's horrible. But Jesus Christ stepped into this world, died in your place on a cross, rose on the third day from the grave, has opened the door for you, sir, you, ma'am, you, sir, you, ma'am, to put your trust in him. And if you do that, he will save you. You can be reborn. You can begin a new life. You can be baptized on the profession of your faith as a follower of Jesus. And you can begin to come alive and to worship the one true God. You can begin to serve, not legalistically, but in the power of the Spirit. You can learn what it is to connect with others relationally. And you can go out and make disciples. So we invite you to that if you're not a Christian. And we pray together. Father, would you sow deeply into our hearts what it means to follow Jesus? That it's more than a one-time decision. It's more than our name on a list of members. It's more than sitting in a room one day a week. It impacts, it touches everything of our life, every aspect of our lives. And Father, would you help us at Woolsey as followers, as men and women and teenagers who believe you've called us to be your followers, that we would be known as men and women who worship the one true God that it would be evident that we are going to make disciples, that we are serving, and that we are connecting with each other in real, viable, sincere, honest, life on life. Would you grant it to be so in Jesus' name? Amen. Let's stand together, church, as we sing. <clears throat>